Okay, let's start today's tutorial. Um, today's tutorial, we have a lot of topics to cover. First of all, I need to talk about NPM, and then I will talk about assignment 2. I will give you some overview on the client-side development, and also I will give you some hints on the front-end development part. And finally, I will talk about the YouTube iframe player API. And this part will be uh, continued in the next week as well, because I don't have enough time to talk about so much slides. Okay, so let me find it. NPM. First part. Yeah, so this is the outline of today's, uh, of, of this set of slides. We have a lot of things to go through. Um, well, first of all, I need to introduce, introduce what is NPM. And according to the documentation, NPM makes it easy for JavaScript developers to share and reuse code. And it makes it easy to update the code that you are sharing. So basically, NPM can be understood as a package manager for JavaScript development. Um, uh, you have used a package manager in many different systems. For example, in Ubuntu, you have apt-get, the command apt-get. It is a package manager for installing, installing different programs. And NPM is a package manager designed for JavaScript. And developers use NPM to share their source code in packages. So packages is package is the unit of distributing code. And NPM facilitates open source project development because they because NPM make it easy to share your source code with the others. So this so the NPM is very is code closely related to our course. Um, and this is almost a must for Node.js applications. Because our assignment tool is developed developed in Node.js, so you need to uh, understand how to use NPM. And we will also need NPM in the next in next Tuesday lecture, which is about React. The React library, you need to uh, you need to use NPM to do different tasks. So you need to learn NPM first. And the first step is to install and update NPM. NPM is when you install Node.js, you automatic, uh, automatically uh, install the NPM, and, but the version may not be the, uh, the latest version. So we usually do an update, an update to, to its latest version. The command is NPM install, and then NPM minus G. I will explain what is minus G later. And if you receive permission denied error when you install a package globally, then you may eat, you may do one of these two steps. You may change the permission to npm's default directory, or change npm's default directory to your to to your own directory. And the the instructions can be found in this page. Okay, now I will go through the installation process of using npm. Um, npm is a package manager so it is on top of our of our project directory so this is our project directory all your source code is is located here and in this folder will at least has uh, at least has two things the first thing is package.json this is the npm configuration file for your project and we will also have a directory called node modules this is the place that npm put the source code from de developed by other developers. So this place is to put the, the installed packages. And npm itself has an installation directory. This is its installation directory. And in, inside this directory, it also has a node modules folder here. This is for installing packages. So what it does what it does different between between these two directory? So first you need to know that npm packages can be installed either locally or globally, and you can find a lot of npm packages at this page. So let me show you this page. So inside this page, you can search, you can find packages, and. Uh, Let's say I want to find a game called uh, Battle Ship Game, and then this is 
the package called Battleship Game, and this is a terminal Battleship Game. I will use this game to for for the demonstration. Now open up the terminal, and then uh, let's say I have a working directory called Tam. Let me remove everything here first. Yeah, it's nothing. And now I can install this package by typing npm install and then uh, the package name is battleship-game Then npm will download this package for you And uh, it's pulling the source code from, from the internet so it's a bit slow Yeah, okay And then after this process then there is a new directory called node modules here and inside this directory there are lots of things so I just install one package but there are so many packages installed what is, the, what is the reason? the reason is that the installer package which is battleship game has a lot of dependency it uses other packages to support itself so you need to download this dependency first so these are the dependencies of, of the Battleship game package and now I go into the Battleship game folder and uh, this is the source code of the game and I can take a quick look in it yeah, so this is the source code everything is open source so you can read the source code yourself uh, and I can also run it Start. and then play this game you can try this game yourself this is a very simple terminal based game so I don't, don't spend much time on it okay so I just go through this process I type npm install and then the package name then npm, the package manager, will download the source code from, from the package repository, for example in github and it downloads the source code and then put it in node modules folder because I am installing this npm package locally so, so, um, so the source code is put into your own project directory it's put here okay? And if you want to uninstall it, you can type this command npm uninstall and the package name. Very simple. And, and the other way to install an npm package is to install it globally. So the command is a little bit different. A new uh, argument minus g npm install minus g and then package name. Then npm will install this package into npm installation directory. So it, it first download the source code and then put it in this folder. So what it does what is the difference between storing the source code here and here? The main difference is, is that when npm install it globally, then, then this package will be available to all the other projects in this system. So when you install it globally, then not only your own project other project other projects in your computer will will be able to use this package so this is the only difference okay and you can also uninstall it that's just change and install into an install okay so this is the basic process of using npm to install and uninstall packages Okay, and the next part is to rebuild an application with npm install. So what do I mean? Well, I mean that when let's let's consider this scenario. First, you are download a Node.js application online, and then you want to re uh, you want to start this Node.js application on your own computer. Then most properly, this application will not include other packages developed not developed by this developer. So, so you need to first install these required packages yourself first. 
So I use npm install, use this command. This, by executing this command, npm will do two things. The first thing is to read package.json in the project directory. So this is, it reads the configuration file for your project. And then, according to the contents of package.json, it will install all the dependencies specified in package.json. So it read and then find what packages you need and then it download it for you and create a folder called node modules and put all the source code here. And after that, your application is ready to work. Okay, so this is also a, um, a very important command. And, and the next part is about managing your Git repository. Because when you run npm install, then your application, your project directory will have a new folder called node modules. But these are not the source code developed by you. It is developed by the others. So you probably don't want them in, to put into your own Git repository. So this is a good practice to exclude this directory from your Git repository. So the way to do is to use a git ignore file to exclude the directory. And there's a sample git ignore file. Let me go to this page, git ignore.io, and then search. Because I'm developing a, a, a node application, so I search node, and then generate. And this is the sample git ignore file. It excludes a lot of things. It excludes the logs and runtime data and so on, and the most important ones are node modules. So it excludes the node modules package at the node modules direction. Okay, so please do this when you uh, when you create your own Git repository for assignment two. This is important. Just put this file into your project directory and name it as dot git ignore, then it will be okay. Uh, go back to the slide. Okay, so we are now ready to go into the details of package.json. We usually use package.json to, local, to manage locally installed npm packages. So why we use package.json? It has two functions, uh, three functions. The first function is to serve as the documentation of your project. Because package.json specify all the all the packages you need in your applications. So it is you can treat it as a documentation of all the dependencies. And the second function is to specify the version of a package. Because your own package may have a may has a lot of functions and a lot of versions and you want to spec you want to specify clearly what function what version is your project uh, is. So you use package.json to specify the version number. And the third, third function is to make your build reproducible. Because I just introduced this command, npm install. And why npm install works? Because it uses the package.json file to, to, to rebuild your application. So it is important to include the package.json file and as the file extension imply, it is in JSON format. So JSON format looks like this, very simple. And, and package.json has at least two fields, the name and version. Name is your project name. You can name it as anything. But there are some, some requirements. It has to be all lowercase, one word, one no space, but you can have uh, dashes and underscores, and you also need to include a version number. And you can use npm init to create a package.json file. So let's see a demo uh, here. Now let's let's remove everything here. Okay, and then npm init. So it was 
start asking you a lot of questions. The project name, I name it as Tam, version number 1.0.0, and the description, ha uh -huh. and the entry point. Entry point is the means the entry point of your application. Now because I I have nothing in my project, so I just keep the default value. And the test command is for testing your application. I don't have a test yet, so keep it empty. And git repository is the URL of this project. And let's keep it empty. Keywords, nothing. Over, nothing. License, nothing. And this is the output of npm init. So let's confirm. And a new file called package.json is generated. This is a sample output of npm init. And if you don't want to, if you don't want to answer those questions, you want to keep all default values, then type npm init minus minus yes. Then it's done. All default values. Okay. Okay, now let's go back to this figure. So I just uh, described the installation process of using npm. Uh, npm install a package into node modules folder, but, but the npm install command does not update this file. That means that this package is not included in, th in this project yet. So to include this project, I can add a new argument minus minus and then save then npm will update the the package.json file for you so let's see uh, npm okay let's see the current content first it's like this now let's say I install a package battleship game again and then minus save then it will download the source code from the remote repository and then and then the file package.json will be updated. Let's see. Okay, there are new fields called dependencies and the just installed package battleship game is included in this file. Okay? So when you really want to use a package in your project, then Please remember to update this file as well. Don't just install it in your in your notebook modules directory. You need to also update this file. Otherwise, the others cannot rebuild your application. Then they cannot run your application. It is a very important step. Okay, the last part. The last part is the script section in package.json. For example, in an express application, the scripts section in package.json is like this. And this section is to define the scripts for when you execute some special npm command. So what do I mean by special command? Let's see a sample uh, express application. Okay, this is my express application. I already run npm install, so there's a node modules directly here. And in the package.json file, there's a, there's a script session. And, and I set it to start equal to echo hello. So what will happen? Now I type this command, npm and then start. So the start matches with this one, and enter, and you see the terminal output is hello. So this is the output of this command, echo hello. So now you see that this session is to, is to specify some startup command for your application. So it is uh, very important to know that. You can change it into other things. You can change it to this one. This one is to, ex to start a node web server so when I type npm start then a web server is executed um, so this 
this is the end of, of this set of slides. This is of slides provides you all the things you need in the VHJS lab in the next next month and uh, next Tuesday lecture and also in assignment two. And there are much more to explore. You can read the documentation yourself to see what functions do NPM provides to you. Okay. So I go to the next set of slides. So many slides today. Wow. Okay, so the next slide is about assignment 2 overview. Today I will talk about the client side of assignment 2 and I will provide some hints on the front end development. First of all, I have a demonstration, but let's take a look on the layout design first. You don't need to fo strictly follow the design, but you at least as you you have you have to meet the following requirements. So this is a desktop view. In a desktop view, you have three components. The first is the YouTube player. This is a YouTube player that that uh, plays the videos in the YouTube. And then the next component is a control panel. This is for controlling the playback in this player. And the third component is a playlist. The playlist is for is to uh, Control what videos do this player plays, and uh, in this control panel, all the buttons are displayed with icons only, no description, no text. As you can see that all are the font of some icons. And the next view is the tablet view. The screen width is a little bit. Uh, is, is decreased in is in this range. Um, there are two components only. The first one is the control panel, and the next is the playlist. So you can see that in this tablet view, we don't have the YouTube player. The player is just removed or uh, uh, hidden. And in the control panel, all the buttons are displayed with two things the icons and also the text description. This is the only views that we have the icons and description at the same time. Okay, the, the last view is the phone view. In the phone view, we again have two components. The first one is the control panel and the second one is the playlist. And in, inside the control panel, the buttons are displayed with icons only. No description again. So in the client side, you need to implement a responsive UI. Responsive UI has been uh, uh, covered in the last tutorial. And since we we will resize the window without refreshing the page, so you are forced to do the screen width detection in client side, not in server side, okay? So the, the suggested solution is to use Bootstrap or CSS media queries but don't use JavaScript, it, it will be too complicated. And you are free to rearrange the components, but they must meet the requirements in the specification. Okay, so now let's see the demo. Someone is calling. Okay, let's go to the browser first. So this is the desktop view of my application. Uh, now it has no videos, so I need to add some videos into my playlist first. I prepare four, pay, four videos. I copy the video ID and then the player the, the video is added into the playlist. didn't copy it. Okay, so I have added three videos into my playlist. Now I can start the video playback. I click the play button. What is up guys, it's TechRex here. And here I have an iPhone 6 videos. with me. Let me fast forward. I can do a fast forward. Go ahead and backwards. Backwards. 
on fire. See, like, fall out. I think it's broken. Now, pause it to appreciate the broken iPhone. Yes. Play, and I can mute it. I don't want to hear his voice, so I mute it, and then I can stop it, play, and then go to the next video. I love these videos. Yeah, because our lecturer is here. Yeah, and I can also click on the playlist to see some to to play a specific videos so I can go back to the iPhone video or the second video or the third video no problem and up to this part this assignment is not interesting because I do everything in the same machine so now I take out my my phone not the broken one and go to the same page I have a QR code here, so I scan the QR code and go to the same page. Okay. Okay. So I can click on the button of my uh, on my phone. Then let's say I click the pause button. Then the video playback is paused. You can see that. And continue paying. And fast forward. And unmute. Will the videos? And when you come back and to the go school, go to the previous video. What is up, guys? Techrex here. Here I have an iPhone 6 with me, fully working, and we've also got a little little experiment here. We're gonna be no problem. And for playlist management, I can remove a videos from the playlist. I can click the delete button. It's it's quite small. Yeah. I click the delete button and then the playlist and then the videos is removed from the playlist. I can also click the clear all button to remove everything. Yeah. So that what you need to do in assignment two. It is very simple, you have a local mode and then have a remote remote mode and that's all. And to finish this assignment, you need to go through these steps. Something uh, there are some things that you may not need to use, but but we'll we'll still cover it because it may be also useful for your project. So I will cover these topics. Uh, so let's get back to the slides. Now I'm going to give you some hints on the front end development. First, the QR code display. Actually, this part is very simple. You just use the Google Charts API and then you can get this QR code. You don't even need a server to do this. You just need to use JavaScript to generate the, the URL and then you get the QR code. So this, uh, this is the HTML for getting this URL, uh, the QR code. I use an image tag and then the URL is like this. I connect to Google APIs and then specify that I want to use a QR code and then the image size is, is this one you can change the image size yourself and then the last part the CHL argument is to specify the data you want to encode and if you want to encode a URL you need to first use UTF-8 URL encoder you need to encode the URL like this you see that the colon becomes percent Free A and, and and I would say this URL is encoded and you can use the JavaScript and code URI components function to do so. You can go to the reference to see how to use this function. It's just very simple, just pass the argument into this function and then it will return this this thing for you. And if you want to encode the current URL, that means the current page, the URL of the current page then you access this field in, in JavaScript code, location.href. If you want to include this uh, variable into this URL, then you need to use JavaScript to generate the image tag. For example, you can use documents.write to generate this tag. It's uh, very simple DOM scripting. 
So you must be able to, to do this. Very simple. And the next part is about the playlist management. You need to support three operations. First, you need to uh, support adding a new video into your playlist. And then you can remove the pay, uh, remove the videos from the playlist. And finally, you must be able to uh, clear all the videos in the playlist. And of course, this playlist should be displayed in your web page. Otherwise, I don't know if if the operation is 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 okay. And the suggested formats of displaying a videos in the playlist is video ID and then colon and then the video title. I will talk about how to retrieve the video title from the video ID in the following slides. So for playlist management, you have three things to do. The first thing is to uh, update the UI when I add or remove a video from the playlist. So there are two main methods. The first method is to, is to do DOM scripting yourself. You can use these functions to update the DOM sheet of your web page and then the UI can be updated uh, dynamically. So for this part, you can read the natural looks on JavaScript. Uh, maybe part 1 or part 2, I don't remember. Or you can use jQuery if you, if you know how to use it. This is a very, uh, very useful library for, for updating the DOM sheet. And the second method is to use React or Backbone.js. These are some uh, front-end front -end MVC framework for, for, for dynamic web page. So you may want to use it. And React will be covered in the next, to, uh, next Tuesday to, uh, lecture. And Backbone.js will be covered in the next week tutorial. And the second task. The second task is to add a video to the test box, test box. So this test box support entering the video ID or the YouTube URL. If I enter YouTube URL, how can I retrieve the YouTube uh, video ID? You can simply copy this function to your assign, uh, to your source code, and then when you get a YouTube URL, then you pass the URL into this uh, function, then you can get back the video ID. You can just copy this script to your assignments. And the last uh, third task, the third task is to display the video title for each video in the playlist. Because I just entered the video ID into the test box, I don't, I, I don't enter the video title. So you need to retrieve the video title from YouTube. And the trick is to use uh, YouTube Data API. And this is the documentation, and I will go through the steps of, of preparing for using the YouTube Data API. First, you need to have a Google Developers account. Just log into your Google account, and then go to this page, and it will ask you to agree something, and then you click agree. <coughs> and then enable and manage APIs. Just click on the Google Developers console enable the feature of using the APIs, and then create a new project. So I name my new project as YouTube Remote. You can use other name, no problem. And click Create. And then when you when the project is created, it will show you this page for selecting what APIs you want to use. I click on the YouTube Data API because I want to use this API. I click on it and then click Enable. And it will ask you to create a credentials. The credential is for accessing the, is for communicating with the YouTube server. So it is important to get a key or get a credential from this page. You click go to credentials and then create a new credentials. And um, I will specify where I want to use the, this API. You can click web server or web browser. I don't think there will be any difference and click on public data because video title is a public data so i just missed the public data and then click the button and create an, an api key i named my api key as server key one you can change the name and then you can get your credentials now you can use your api key to send a get request to this url 
you put the video ID here and your API key here, then you can get better response in JSON format. I can show you the, the format. Uh, oh, I need to copy the URL first. So this is the URL. Oh yeah, I have history. Oh, nothing. Oh yeah. So this is the response of the URL. I specify my API key and video ID and I get back this. This is how JSON formats things. And I prepare a demo page, a demo page, YouTube, data API. You can just put your API key. Let me copy my API key. Where's my key? Yeah, and then the ID. Submit. Yeah. And the video title is displayed here. How do I do this? You can go to the source code. It should be index.js. I, I put some comments here so you can study it yourself. Just basically, I use, <coughs> I use jQuery to send an AJAX get request to the YouTube server. And then in the response, I read items, the, the, the first item of the items array and then snippet and then title. So this is the video title of the specified video ID. So you can study this uh, example code and then put it in your own, own assignments. So this is very simple to use. And then last part about playlist man management is that you need to store the playlist on the server, but we didn't cover server-side development yet, so you don't need to work on that part uh, at this time, but you may hard code the playlist on client side for now. And for the YouTube player control, you need to support these operations. And after today's tutorial, you can start implementing the UI player and control logic. You can implement all the playback control functions on your page. On the same page, you don't need to consider remote part yet. And I can get you get give you a hint. You can wrap all the YouTube iframe API calls in your own functions, so that you can be a uh, you can extend your code to support remote control later conveniently. Okay, so this is the second set of slides. Now I go to the first set of slides, and I have five minutes left. So I don't have enough time. So this API, this API is the is the magic behind using my phone to control the YouTube player on the desktop. So this is a very useful API for controlling YouTube player playback. And I will talk about the first four parts and I will leave the remaining parts to the next week tutorial. So I first give you an overview. The iframe player API lets you embed and control a YouTube video player on your website using JavaScript. So everything is in JavaScript, no server side things. Everything is, your, is on client side. And the APIs post contents to an iframe tag on your page. So the YouTube player is inside and iframe tag and inside this iframe tag is this is a, a HTML page that resides in the YouTube server and by doing this the APIs can provide you more flexibility because YouTube can serve different types of player for you it may be an HTML5 player or a flash player and you don't need to care about which player is used you just need to use the API to call the functions and then the API will create a YouTube player for you. And the API provides two functions for you. The first one is to provide operations on video playback. And the second one is to triggering some uh, triggering events when that you can that 
can be handled by your own event listeners. Because when the playback continues, it, there may be different events, like when the video is stopped, a new event will be triggered. Now I will talk about the requirements of using this API. The first requirement is that the browsers should support the HTML5 post message feature. And mainstream browser already support it. For example, Chrome, Safari, Firefox, and of course, forget about IE. I don't know if it supports, I don't know. I didn't check. And why HTML5? Before explaining why using HTML5, we need to know what happened what happened before HTML5 is 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 released. So before HTML5, the let's see this page. This is a page, and this page, this is my page uh, which is put on the Heroku server. This is a server, and then inside this page I have an iframe. And this iframe is created by the iframe API and the page is under youtube.com in the YouTube server. Before HTML5, it is impossible that this JavaScript code to access the resources in this iframe, uh, in this iframe because they are in different server or uh, in different origin. We sometimes call different server as different origin. And this JavaScript code cannot access the resources inside this iframe because they are in different origin. So the browser blocks this this uh, the code execution because it violates the same origin policy. There's a same origin policy. This is for security because after, otherwise, then it will be very dangerous. You can imagine that if I have a JavaScript code in my page and then and I can, I can change the contents of an iframe, then it will be very dangerous. I can change anything. I can also, uh, uh, for example, this is a login page, then my JavaScript code can access the login page to get the username and, I, and password, and the user don't know this is, this is not good for security. So before HTML5, this, this access is simply blocked. But HTML5 defines the window.post message method. It enables cross origin cross origin communication. In this example, the YouTube site tells the browser that it opens a point for for outside for JavaScript code outside to access the resources in this iframe. So it's so this page explicitly uh, uh, open a door for for this code so it can use post message method to to do communication with this page so this JavaScript code can now access the resources in this iframe by using post message this is a controlled cross origin communication by doing this uh, by using this function then I can use my JavaScript code to access the resource in this iframe so it is required that the browser supports post message feature. Otherwise, this, this communication will not be possible. And the second requirement is that the viewport is at least 200 pixels times 200 pixels. And this is to ensure that the player can be fully displayed. And in assignment 2, you don't need to care about this because the player is only displayed in desktop view. So so this requirement is automatically fulfilled. And the last requirement is to implement a JavaScript function called on YouTube iframe API ready. When the API finish loading, then the API will automatically call this function. So you need to have this function in your JavaScript code so the API can call your function. Now let's see how to use the API. It is very simple, a HTML page, and I have a DIV code. The ID is player, and then I load a JavaScript code. And inside the JavaScript code, I do two things. First, I load the iframe API asynchronously. These four lines is to load the iframe API asynchronously. I use stop scripting to, to create a new tag, new script tag, and then set the source as this one. And then I put the script tag into my HTML page. I insert it into the DOM sheet. 
So the script will be will be loaded asynchronously. And then I define a reference called player that is to it that is for controlling the video playback of my YouTube player. And I define the on YouTube iframe API ready function. This function will be automatically executed when the YouTube API finish is loaded. So this is very important to have this function. And inside this function, I just create a new player, a new YouTube player. That is uh, this thing, the video player. And the first argument is player. So what it is, this one mesh with this. So this is to specify where do the iframe is insert. I want to insert the YouTube AP, uh, YouTube player in this div, so I put its ID as the first argument. Okay. And the second argument is an option. It's the settings of the YouTube player. I can set up the width and height and also some variables, some options, and I can set up the video ID. This is the video ID for the YouTube player. When I click the play button, then this video will be, will be played in the YouTube player. I can also set up some uh, events. I want to listen to on Reddit events, so I set up the event, and this is the event listener. And also, it is important to store the reference. After getting a reference to the player object, you can use the player API methods to control the video playback. And uh, these are the operations required in assignment 2. And to support this function, you can call these methods. On the player reference, you call player.playvideo. Then the YouTube player will start playing the video, and you can pause it by calling pause video or stop video, mute and unmute. And you can do a fast forward by, and rewind by, by sticking to a specific time of the video. But this part is a, is a little bit tricky, so I will leave this to the next tutorials. Okay, so that's all of today's tutorial. Next week we will talk about, we will continue uh, the YouTube iframe player API and also start backbone.js. I will talk about how to use the backbone.js to implement the, 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 the web page. Okay, so that's all of today's tutorial. See you next week. Next week.